Hello, I'm Bob Harlan. I'm the chair of the uh, Lamb Council. Uh, I want to start out by thanking our ti titanium and platinum level sponsors for their generous support, Anodyne, Superior Farms, and American Wool Services. I think we need to take a second and thank the ASI and the state organizations for making the CPAP and LDB payments become a reality without these organizations. Uh, I just don't know if we'd ever got that done right. I think that everyone should uh, should thank the local organizations by maybe uh, sending a little more dues. The Lamb Council has, has no new or sunsetting resolutions to address, so we'll skip that part. Uh, we'll go right into the uh, program. We have three experts on the on the docket today, Dr. David Anderson, Tim Bomber, and Megan Wortman. We also have me, so that adds up to 3.2 experts on this call. Uh, I'm glad to report before we start that I have the uh, lamb market exactly where I wanted it. It's taken me almost eight months to get it there, uh, but I'm glad we are there and I know it's going to get a little confusing, but it, you'll probably want to send personal thanks to me. So if you send a personal thanks to the chat box in the bottom of your screen, Brad Boner is going to sort through those. And if you have question and answer, questions for our, our, our program people, put, please put them in the question and answer section. And Erica Sanko, our staff person, and Lori Hubbard, the vice chair of this committee, will handle those. So with that, aren't you glad I got the lamb market where we wanted it? I'll introduce <laughs> Dr. David Anderson. Uh, he's a professor and extension economist in the Department of Agriculture Economics at Texas A&M University. His extension education and research activities are in livestock and food products, marketing and agriculture policy. So go ahead, Dr. Anderson. Well, thanks. Here, I'll, let me share my screen here. Maybe. Hey, there we go. Well, thanks for inviting me back again. I sure appreciate the opportunity to be with you all today. And, and uh, uh, I'm going to jump right in and, and, and talk fast to keep us on time. And uh, anyway, thanks again. Uh, I'm going to hit about, actually, I'm going to hit more than three things, but, you know, we do stuff in threes so often. Uh, I do want to talk about imports and stocks. Uh, production for the coming year and, and a touch on demand. And I hope that'll weave in pretty good with our next speakers as well. Uh, is, is Hopefully I'll hit some stuff that sets them up just right. Uh, since I said those three things I wanted to hit on, I'm going to start with something completely different. Uh, and really to point out the drought monitor map. You know, I think I think there's a couple of other things other than, you know, stocks and imports that are going to affect our market, our across all of livestock agriculture in the coming uh, months and the rest of the year. And that's really how this, uh, how this drought, as shown in the drought monitor data, develops. Uh, I think that's one of the kind of the key factors for, for livestock markets going forward is, is how this thing continues to develop and hopefully not intensi intensify. It'd be nice to get some relief, but I, I think that's one thing to keep in mind going forward. Uh, I think the second thing is, uh, and I'm going to show this with Omaha corn prices, uh, and this run-up in overall feed costs, I think, is another pretty big factor across all of our livestock markets uh, for this year. And really, you know, how feed costs develop uh, is going to hit all of, uh, all of livestock. Uh, you know, one of the things that I, I keep in mind here is really this run-up is not driven by necessarily a short crop in the U.S. It's driven by some short crops in the rest of the world and demand for the feed that we produce, demand for corn and soybean meal, particularly in China as their hog herds increase again following uh, African swine fever. So we're exporting more and we're exporting more because of shortfalls in the rest of the world. I, keep, I like to keep in mind that, you know, a really high price this time of the year is really a signal, a market signal to corn farmers to plant more acres. And so one of the things I do expect to see is more acres of corn and soybean planted. 
uh, this year. And as we look forward in terms of thinking about normal trend yields, uh, certainly opportunity again for very large crops and some relief on the feed cost side. Uh, once we get past planting, we get through the normal kind of uh, uh, summer heat fears and drought fears and all of that that usually drives up and gets us a weather market, but uh, certainly looking for some some price relief later in the year. So I think that drought and, and feed costs are two pretty important factors to keep in mind uh, going forward. Now to more lamb topics, uh, I'm gonna start with lamb and mutton in cold storage. And I think the big story here is just really this sharp decline in the amount of stocks in cold storage. Where we get down to about 25, uh, we get down to about 25 million pounds at the closing out uh, 2020, uh, almost 10 million pounds less than the average and about 10 million pounds less than what we had at this time a year ago. So really, I, I think that's a tremendous story. We, we certainly talk a lot about sometimes overwhelming stocks in, in, the, in the cold storage report. This is a case where we have worked off those stocks and I think supplemented uh, a little less production during the year. We supplemented that out of stocks, uh, various other ways that we've moved product as well. And so I think this starts out as a real positive story for market prices in the coming year is not having that overhang uh, in the marketplace. So I think that's another, uh, uh, I think a positive story as well. If I looked at lamb imports, uh, imports for the year were actually a little bit below uh, last year. Uh, and if so, you know, I think that's another story that I think is also positive for the lamb market. I would expect, come, you know, going into 2021, that we see some increase in imports like we might normally see seasonally. But um, again, I think this imp overall import story is probably pretty positive for the market, given uh, given some times in the past where we've really had huge supplies come in and, and really pressure our prices lower. So I think between stocks and imports, that's, in, that's important. One thing I would say about imports, this, this data is just lamb imports. If we took lamb and mutton combined, we saw a pretty significant increase in imported uh, product, but the data would suggest it's all, all the increases on the mutton side. So, you know, I think that's a pretty interesting turn of, of, of events where that's been a growth uh, compared to, to lamb actually being down. So I think that sort of supports, uh, again, helps to support the idea of lamb prices going forward. I'm gonna keep checking my watch over here, make, keep myself on time. Uh, we're gonna know here, I guess in about an hour of my time about uh, uh, this year's USDA NAS uh, sheep inventory report. Uh, if I look at the number of breeding ewes, I tend to expect uh, the number of breeding ewes to decline a little bit, but, you know, in, in the big picture, basically pretty flat as uh, uh, what my expectations are for that report to say, which then also colors sort of my expectations for production this year uh, as well. One reason I think for uh, relatively flat to maybe a little smaller lamb, if a uh, number of at least the breeding ewe flock, if we look at mature sheep slaughter through the year, uh, we essentially moved the same number of, of sheep uh, or breeding sheep uh, out of a little bit smaller flock. So that would suggest that we, we really, uh, you know, not a lot of change there. Uh, one of the interesting things in the trade data, we've often shipped a, a lot of old ewes to Mexico and the data would suggest that, that really our exports really dried up that direction. So some of those animals stayed here, maybe contributed to a little larger uh, mature sheep slaughter in the US versus uh, shipping them somewhere else. Uh, so I think that again, uh, supports the idea of basically flat numbers. Uh, production, uh, lamb production in the U.S. was down uh, about six and a half percent when I calculate it using this weekly data. Uh, I tend to expect lamb production to be pretty close to, to 2020. Uh, I, I think it's clear we're going to see some different seasonal patterns uh, without all the coronavirus shutdowns, but at least on the production side, I, I would expect production to be pretty close to a year ago. Uh, 
probably down just a little bit. So again, supporting uh, prices, uh, land prices in the U.S. Uh, in 2021. A little bit on demand. Uh, you know, I think, you know, basically I would summarize my thoughts as what's the path to recovery? You know, increasing, you know, in economic growth coming back, increasing employment, getting restaurants back open, particularly so many of our higher end restaurants that have, you know, in some ways suffered worse than the rest of them had, had less ability to stay open. I think it all, I think really our recovery path depends on the recovery in our health. Uh, vaccines, uh, finally getting past this, whatever that shape and timing of that is, I think that path to recovery affects our demand thoughts. I'm actually, one of the things I'm kind of curious about is what consumer changes stick around through all this? What have we, have our broader consuming public changed? You know, what have they changed and what sticks around? I, I got two kind of economist charts to go along with this. One is just simply looking at quarterly gross domestic product, uh, you can see that second that that really steep uh, red bar, which represents the second quarter of 2020. The sharp rebound represents the third quarter. We're watching for the the next round of data to come back to see what kind of economic growth we start charting. But uh, you know, certainly 2020 saw a decline in the size of our economy, a reduction in gross domestic product that has not been, you know, caught up to. But that path of recovery, I think, is is actually, and the expectations of recovery, I think, is a tremendous positive for the land market in 2021. Uh, my argument for that is that because of where lamb goes, the consumers, the types of restaurants it goes to, I think we're sitting on, and my expectation is that we're sitting on a huge amount of pent-up demand from folks that have been sitting at home. They may be working, but they're, they're, they're working from home. They're doing things. They haven't been out. And I, I think that that ability to spend money, that desire to spend money, has the potential to extremely recharge our economy going forward. Uh, and so I want to show that idea with something, uh, one other set of data that we don't use very much, um, mainly because there's not much call to it. But if we looked at personal savings as a percent of disposable income, and you see this surge in the second quarter of 2020, where on average or across all consumers, folks saved more than 25% of their disposable income in the second quarter. They were stuck at home, they couldn't go out, uh, restaurants were closed, bars were closed, travel was shut down. And they, I think if we look across this, uh, that's a lot of money that went into savings. Even in the third quarter, as things loosened up, we still got personal, uh, personal savings greater than 15% of income. Now, that masks some important differences in the economy in terms of people. We got a ton of folks who are out of work. If we think about the restaurant sector, uh, hotels, travel, all of those sectors that are hurting dramatically, yet the rest of the economy, there are segments that have boomed. Uh, and that's where that savings is, which gives us, I think, the potential to really jumpstart uh, some economic growth as things open uh, as we get past this. So I think that's an interesting set of data to think about. I think this also argues for higher land prices through economic growth and growing demand uh, throughout 2021 and into 2022. If I just showed per capita consumption, my long-term projections, I, I got a, a slight decline related to mostly um, some moderation in overall imports uh, and, and, a, and roughly flat uh, U.S. production uh, to the year before. And if you think about that and our population grows, uh, we end up eating a touch less per person. Look at the scale, it's less than one-tenth of one pound. Uh, but basically, I think we can make a pretty fair argument for uh, some strong demand for lamb on top of basically flat supplies in the coming year, which argues for better prices. Uh, Bob, maybe even better than where you've got them to so far. So we'll put another gold star on that for your efforts in this year. 
Uh, just a couple of price charts, I think, fit with, with, the, with uh, Bob, with your comments, certainly starting out higher than we were a year ago. If we look at kind of three market average, feeder lamb prices, slaughter lamb prices, this uh, Sioux Falls series, certainly starting out the year better than where we were a year ago. So just some, just a little more evidence of higher prices. If I was going to summarize this, my expectation kind of as an economist is I expect higher lamb prices this year than last year. I think low cold storage stocks help that. Uh, I do think, you know, some, some reduced imports helped us. Uh, the U.S. with higher prices will be an attractive destination. Uh, I wouldn't want to overlook new packing capacity as well. Something that I think is pretty welcome if, you know, from an economist standpoint in terms of supporting prices, uh, I think that's positive as well. And what I hope we're going to see some restaurant recovery and economic recovery. And, and that really kind of summarizes my comments, you know, thinking about this as an economist. And I'll leave you with a big thank you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be back with you all again. And let me unshare this screen and jump to the next one. I think I got it unshared. <laughs> so thanks, Dr. Anderson. I think what we'll do is uh, is we'll wait till the end, and I see some questions coming up, and we'll wait till the, all the presentations, and then uh, and then we'll open it up to questions. So if you'll stay around, we'll do that. Sure, will. Thank you. So next on our program is Tim Baumert. Uh, from the New Holland uh, sales. He, he's from Dalmoth, Pennsylvania. He's a meat broker and he also manages the goat and sheep sales at the New Holland sales stable. And he's gonna give us an update on Eastern ethno ethnic lamb market. So go ahead, Tim. This is a little worrisome. So, so maybe Tim's not with us right now. So maybe we should go on. If Megan's here, we'll go to Megan Wortman, the, 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 the executive director of the American Lamb Board, and she'll talk about how American Lamb checkoff adjusted to COVID-19. Megan, are you here? Yeah, and it looks like Tim may be trying to call in, but do you want me to go ahead? Oh, it doesn't matter to me. Okay. So... Hello, everybody. I'm live from Denver, Colorado, where we certainly wish we could all um, be together. This convention virtually is going amazing. I'm super impressed, but I have to say I miss the interaction and seeing you guys. Oftentimes, I only get to see you this one time a year, so I'm a little bit sad. I am going to share my screen, Bob, and... Hope this is working. Is it? Can you see it, Bob? Nope, I only see you. Oh man, we are messing up Lamb Council. Well, we're going to get down to my personal opinion, and I don't think anyone wants it. Okay, how about now? Now you're good. Okay. So obviously it's been a crazy wild roller coaster of a year with lots of ups and downs. And our industry has certainly um, faced a lot of challenges and losses. Um, but luckily we are seeing some new opportunities and some even some new customers emerging from the pandemic. It was certainly heartbreaking to lose Mountain States Rosen and the closing this summer. Um, but we're blessed with new plants opening in both Colorado and Texas, as we heard about yesterday morning. Um, we're also really encouraged by the strength of our non-traditional markets. And I just want to point out that's not just ethnic sales that we talk a lot about. That's also direct to consumer sales through farmers markets 
and we were really impressed, saw lots of producers and companies very quickly shifting into online, online sales programs and really creative, innovate, creating innovative ways to get American lamb in consumers' hands. So really excited about the growth of non-traditional markets. In our traditional markets, obviously, we literally lost um, food service sales overnight with the lockdowns and shutdowns um, with restaurants. Devastating. As Rick mentioned um, yesterday morning, pre-COVID, about 50% of our American lamb is sold through food service channels. And a lot of that is our middle meats, our, our racks. So really challenging to lose um, that segment. And fine dining, of course, um, Dr. Anderson just touched on this, fine dining, the um, hotels, cruise ships, that's the segment that's being hit the hardest and that's where American lamb is sold. And it's really sad, fine dining especially, um, is, is hit the hardest and many of them are not gonna survive. Lamb's been really a hard sell for their takeout only meal options and losing outdoor seating during the winter months, we're seeing lots of them even close for winter breaks and sadly many of them are not, we're gonna see not reopen. So food service has been a tremendous loss and challenge for us. Luckily again, as we talked about um, yesterday morning, um, retail sales are up and strong. And certainly that started with the stockpiling um, that consumers were doing early on in COVID. But the lamb sales growth has continued throughout 2020. Um, these figures show March through August, but our latest um, retail scanner data shows continued growth. So really exciting. This shows more consumers purchasing lamb for at-home use. And as Rick mentioned yesterday, we know through the IRI scanner retail data that a lot of times consumers were purchasing lamb for the first time during COVID and they're going back now to purchase more. So certainly we would agree that the biggest opportunity coming out of COVID is that consumers are now cooking more meals at home. So the restaurant shutdown and dining options being um, out of play, we're working from home. We generally just have more time to experiment, try new recipes, even willingness to try complex recipes. Cooking has really become a form of entertainment, a coping mechanism, stress relief through all of this. We're seeing consumers engaged in online cooking classes and purchasing new cooking equipment like Instant Pots and sous vides so um, really we see this as becoming the new norm. And certainly consumers are turning to comfort foods and new adventurous flavors. And they're also thinking about um, health and wellness and their immune health and fueling and nourishing um, their bodies with foods that are nutrient dense and, and are gonna keep them healthy. All really great opportunities for American lamb. So clearly with all of these um, impacts of COVID and, and changes and trends, the American Land Boards had to really look at our strategies and shift our resources and, and programs to address our new norms. Um, we did continue throughout, um, throughout the year to try to find ways to support the struggling fine dining chefs that we've um, been working with throughout the years. We've been providing a lot of lamb donations for worker relief programs and their takeout promotions. But we've also needed to look at other segments um, where lamb takeout makes more sense, like fast casual chains. We certainly wanted with the retail growth to support and promote our retail partners that are committed to American lamb programs. And as more people are cooking at home and picking up land for the first time, consumer education is really more important than ever. And all of these programs and, and, and changes, we're still very much focused on promoting um, the importance of sourcing American and choosing local products, which I will say I think is resonating now more than ever. And, and we probably have two to three consumers that contact our office either by calling us or through email 
asking where not where they can get lamb, but where they can get American lamb. So it's been really great to have all of those new online shopping resources to share because some consumers just don't have access to American lamb in their areas. So this summer we partnered up with a fast casual chain called Tzatziki's Mediterranean Cafe. They've got 90 restaurants across the country. Really a company that's committed to fresh local um, products, including American lamb. So we partnered up with them to promote their um, takeout lamb family feast, really successful. And then on the retail front, we partnered up this summer with HEB, which is the largest retailer um, in Texas with 350 locations. And there we promoted American Lamb through their health and wellness program, which gave us the ability to engage, educate their 70 plus registered dietitians within the stores. Um, we created custom recipes and information that they mailed out to customers. And of course, most importantly, we had American Lamb cuts on special throughout the summer with great success. You'll see that the sales increased over 40% compared to the same period last year. So obviously throughout 2021, you're gonna see your lamb check off working to duplicate these kinds of promotions with, with fast casual um, food service um, customers as well as, as retailers. So working to find new partners to duplicate those promotions. And then as you guys know, um, the American Lamb Board has been heavily invested in live events and conferences and trade shows and festivals. We love getting out face-to-face -face with chefs and consumers and oftentimes giving people an opportunity to sample and try lamb for the first time. Obviously COVID's really impacted our ability to do that. Um, and, and especially our own series of events we do called Lamb Jam that you guys are familiar with. All that came to a halt and we had to get pretty creative and try some different tactics and ways to continue to engage with consumers and food influencers. So we, we went virtual and had some great success still keeping lamb, you know, approachable and fun and educational. Um, we did a lamb jam at home party um, where people that had already purchased lamb jam tickets got to experience different um, demonstrations, cooking, butchery, et cetera. They got gift bags from us that included coupons so that they could purchase American lamb, took us at home. They were partnered up with a local restaurant where they got a takeout dish to enjoy during the party. Um, we've also hosted in our target markets across the country, virtual dinner parties where we've partnered up with local chefs and the shepherd, the lamb producer that they use to do dinner parties and kits for food influencers. And we've sponsored um, various cooking classes and, and butchery demos. So you'll see us continue to use virtual events until hopefully we'll get back to being live later in 2021. So with more consumers cooking at home and new lamb consumers, we turn to our food blogger partners to create new content for us. So recipes, videos, hosting live cooking classes on their social channels, um, et cetera, um, to really educate and inspire consumers to increase their usage of American lamb. So food bloggers, if you're not familiar, are essentially just food influencers that have websites rich in recipes and cooking information. And then they also have really strong social media followings where they share the recipes and drive their following to their, their blog or their website. And so over the course of 2020, our partners created 78 new recipes that we were able to share throughout the year. And their combined reach is 2.3 million consumers. So that's a great way for us to spread the good word about American lamb. And certainly throughout COVID and, and beyond when things got back to normal, social media continues to be a, our most cost-effective way to share information and ins inspire increased usage of American lamb and really to attract fans through our seasonal social media campaigns. I hope many of you saw the lamb challenge that we launched in the 
And then this summer we turned to a glam burger contest where we were encouraging people to experiment with burgers. We just wrapped up the holiday lamb challenge and going into February lamb lovers month. So these are campaigns where we're giving away prizes, um, doing advertising to attract new fans. The campaigns are promoted by our blogger partners and it's really our best way to keep year round um, cooking inspiration with American lamb. So after we get through um, lamb lovers month, we've been busy putting together a new campaign that will launch this spring all around outdoor cooking adventures. And certainly one of the biggest trends coming out of COVID is um, consumers cooking and entertaining outdoors more. Obviously it gives us an opportunity to gather with friends and family um, and allow for safe, safe social distancing. So it's really exploded. Try to find an outdoor um, heater right now. They cannot be found. So outdoor furniture, grills, um, it really just exploded this summer. And we see this continuing um, for a long time. So really positioning American lamb as an outdoor cooking meat, you know, makes it more accessible and interesting to new consumers. It also provides an opportunity for us to go after a new food service target. So professional pit masters and barbecue restaurants and the like. So for year one in 2021, you'll see us um, releasing a lot of new content around, around outdoor cooking. So new videos, new recipes, infographics. We're developing new partnerships with outdoor enthusiast influencers. So Instagrammers, food bloggers that really specialize in grilling and barbecue. And then we're gonna host a consumer video contest in three different categories, grilling, smoking, and over the fire cooking. And then hopefully in year two, we'll be able to expand on this campaign and get back to what we love to do. Um, and that's activations at events and festivals to really, really promote your product face-to-face. -face. So with that, Bob, I, I would love feedback, not being able to be with you guys. Don't hesitate to email me, call me anytime. I love to interact and get your ideas and feedback. And certainly if you haven't been to our website or if you're not getting our Thursday weekly newsletter by email, I really encourage you to do that. It's really the best way to keep on top of, of what we're doing and programs and resources we have available. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. And, uh, and hopefully at the end of this uh, hour, we'll get some feedback as we do a question and answer session with all three of our presenters. So. Okay, fantastic. You can hang around and I'll ask you a question. Fantastic. Okay. So now I think we have uh, Tim Bomber from New Holland's uh, sales table on, on the phone or on the video. Uh, he's uh, from Dalmatia, Pennsylvania. He's a meat broker who also manages goat and sheep sales at New Holland's sales stable. He's going to give us an update on the Eastern ethnic lamb market. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Go ahead. Okay, I wasn't sure if we were connected or not. How's everybody doing? You're doing good. All right, thank you. Uh, the ethnic market here on the East Coast has done very well this past year. Uh, with all the pandemic going on, people stayed at home and had to buy more product to, to feed their families at home, did not travel out of state and overseas. So all the ethnic markets have done very well. They use all fresh meat. They do not want nothing frozen. Uh, the numbers have declined a little bit in the past year. In 2019, we sold 252,000 goats and lambs. 2020, we're down to 224,000. So that's around 28,000 head less this past year. I think uh, some of them numbers are down because of production, especially on the goat and, and also lambs, but you see it more on the goats, which uh, um, there is a lot more smaller 
farmers starting to put lambs in locally here in Pennsylvania now. Some Amish men are going with 30 and 50 head herds. To the guys out west, is isn't much, but back here, it's a little bit of, every little bit helps. Uh, the larger lambs, as everybody knows, the restaurants all shut down in the East Coast, New York City. They got hurt the most, and uh, the, the cutting lambs, the chops, did not move well. But all the ethnic stuff where the whole carcass got moved, and people kept doing very well this whole year. And that's just kind of a quick rundown uh, how things went to New Holland this past year. If anybody has any questions, uh, glad to answer. Thanks. Hello? Hello? Yep, there you are. I'm sorry. Oh, thanks, Tim. And we'll open up the question and answers. I... Uh... I might add a little bit right here uh, myself before we do the question and answers. Uh, last time sure. the lamb market was good, uh, uh, they asked me to, to do a talk on the lamb market, and I titled that talk The Perfect Storm, and, and it was so interesting because everything in the lamb market was, uh, was chumming along uh, perfectly. Everything was high, and and at this point in the lamb market, and and this the 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 Packer presentation yesterday made me think of this. Uh, the 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 non traditional lamb market is is uh, going along very well, but there's some issues with the traditional lamb market, and one of the issues is the pelts, and the other issue is the is the wool price, and and as as the the pelts have in the past paid for the the uh, the kill costs and left dollars in the feeder's pocket and the and the wool market as they shear these feeder lambs have uh, has uh, paid for the shearing and left dollars in the pocket. So I just think it's incredible. It's incredible that uh, the the meat only the meat in the non traditional and the and the traditional side is carrying this land market. Uh, if we could get the other uh, the other things to help support it, uh, it might even be better. So so all this is done on the meat alone. So with that, uh, I think Lori and and Erica are going to have questions. Yep. Thanks, Bob. Um, Tim, since you're on the phone with us, um, we we're going to ask you a few questions that have come in regarding um, your report from New Holland. First question is, how well do fat lambs sell at New Holland? We're talking over 100 pounds. Can you give us some guidance? The fat lambs in New Holland, uh, much over 100 pounds, are, they only use a certain, a small amount of them for your smaller restaurants or your stores that break them where they make the chops and roasts and the rack of lamb. The majority of the people or a large percentage is here on the East Coast coast, they they sell the whole carcass to a store. And they a lot of them back this way do not like like a very large carcass. Uh thirty to like forty five pound carcass is what they really shoot for. And then the stores will they just more or less chop them up in the cube them, cube them for people. And that's the way people take them home and prepare them. They really don't make chops and roasts and racks of lambs and legs of lambs. You're, you know, you're ethnic type people. So to answer your question, no, hunters and up, if there's not an overabundance of them, they sell very well. If we get too many at one time, they will be the first things that, that take a little bit of a hit on price. Right. Okay. Um, on to the next question. We have um, a wondering kind of if you've seen any changes in the average lamb size this past year versus maybe the year before and, and even going back five years, if you can relate to any of that. Uh, yes. Uh, more people had been bringing them into New Holland and, and selling them Weigh in that 50 to 90 pound range because they're, they're getting educated for what the, the ethnic people and the buyers want here on the East. 
And usually dollar for dollar, they go home with more in their pockets selling a 70 pounder than making them weigh 120 or 140. So a lot more have been marked between that 50 and 90 pound mark in the past year or two. Right. Okay, our next question is, um, where do you see the ethic market going in, in 2021? Have we kind of hit a top? Are you gonna, are we looking for demand to slow down with higher ethnic prices or what, what's your projection from the sale barn side? My projection right now is what we're dealing with. We never have seen anything this high. Lambs, you know, uh, three dollars, three thirty, three fifty a pound alive for these fifty, sixty, seventy pounders. Um, they're starting to get be a little bit of resistance on it. The people can't afford it. They can't get them slaughtered. You know, just overall too much expense for the the final consumer. Uh, but they're still using them because there's no volume. No, the, the volume has declined a little bit. If and when this pandemic gets under control, I think you will see the decline in the summer months and falls like you have done previous years when people can start traveling and flying back home. Uh, I think it'll kind of go back to a somewhat normal late summer, early fall. Land market may drop off a little bit. Winter time increased like always. But due to the pandemic, this whole year everybody's just been stuck at home. People just kept uh, buying food to prepare for their families, and it kept it very good this past year. Yeah. Okay, our next question is, if you just want to reiterate, I know you mentioned it earlier, kind of what that live weight um, is that the ethnic market is looking for. Different ethnic people use different weights, but in general, 50 to 90 pounds. And they got to be fairly, uh, fairly finished. Uh, a fairly decent back on them, not just uh, a real green feeder type lamb coming off pasture. That's not what they're looking for. It's uh, more back this way. Your little farmers, your ranchers, you have smaller lots. They creep feed them. They can they can kind of finish them off or put a nice bloom on them, weighing seventy pounds. I'm not saying they're going to be choice or prime, but just a real a real good cover. Okay, perfect. So we have another question asking um, if you see larger lambs doing better around um, some of the holidays, the Italata, when the Muslims want those larger lambs to distribute? No, because the Eid, there again, mainly they want them uh, 70 to 90 pounders. They will buy 100, 110s if they can't get enough of them 80, 90s. But around Eid and Ramadan, 70 to 90 pounds for the East Coast here is the, the prime weight. Okay. And then it looks like the final question we have for you um, asks about prices. If um, you mentioned that the number of head were down this past year, if if prices, it says, were prices down as well as the number of head? No, the prices are actually higher this year due to the numbers being down. And because of the, I believe, because of the pandemic, everybody staying home and could not travel. So therefore, they kept buying fresh meat at these fresh meat markets every week to feed their families. So therefore, you know, people didn't leave the country or go to other states. They just kept buying meat and staying at home and feeding their families. So that's what's kept it up this whole past year. Right. Okay. This has been um, one of the highest markets I have ever seen. It has. And as Bob mentioned, he's finally got the price up. So. <laughs> Absolutely. There we go. 
<laughs> okay, well, appreciate um, all that you've contributed. We have a few more questions here for some of our other speakers. Um, this one, I believe, is probably Dr. Anderson. We heard yesterday that Australia will be looking at ramping up exports to our market with cold storage numbers and overall market shape now. How do you feel? Um, do you feel we can maintain our domestic market share or will it just revert to a price point issue and the consumers purchase the imported lamb? I think that's a really good question. In fact, I was typing an answer in here. I wasn't so <laughs> sure if I was supposed to wait or start typing. So I started typing as slow as I am. So I'll just say this instead. You know, I, I think I think that's a really good question because you know certainly a higher price in the U.S. makes us a more attractive destination, and so if you see those higher prices, then uh, you would think, yeah, you know, we might likely get some more imports. You know, I do think uh, some of those imports are likely going to be tempered by um, you know their ability to rebuild their flocks after fires and drought. Uh, and, you know, recognizing high prices, you might want to rebuild herds to be able to sell to those. And that's a more kind of long-term proposition. Uh, but, you know, certainly price point is important. Uh, you know, I, I think we certainly have a market that, you know, to, I, I think this goes along with some of Megan's comments. You know, we have, we have part of our market that wants a U.S. lamb, wants a domestic product, our stuff. We have some other, you know, whether it's restaurant chains or whatever, that may be more price determined. And, and, and as their product comes in that is cheaper, that is, you know, competitive with us, uh, you know, that may very well, you know, be able to undercut our own, our own domestic prices. And that does lead to some reduced market share. Uh, but, you know, as we find, as we continue to find more consumers who want a U.S., product, we may find some very valuable consumers there who are really looking for what we're supplying, uh, not just, uh, you know, not just driven by the lowest price they can get. I think that's a great question, though. Hope that was a fair answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the next question um, is, with the entry of the ethnic buyers into the commercial feeder land market this fall, how are the lambs going to be reported through harvest plants in relation to the national federally inspected slaughter? Um, what percent of ethnic lambs harvested are reported via federally inspected? Somebody want to take that? Dr. Anderson, do, do you have anything to add to that or? I had to get that, I was <laughs> muting myself. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, I think there's some interesting data around if, uh, you know, as we look at the, if, if we look at like total lamb slaughter, you know, the percent going to federally inspected plants uh, that, you know, has been declining in recent years. Yet there's some evidence from the, the, uh, the recent report on the ethnic lamb market that some of those, some of those ethnic lambs, you know, we might see them start to go into uh, into federally inspected plants that are headed to specific markets. And, and so, you know, I think that would suggest that maybe we see a rebound in, in the total percent of lambs slaughtered that are going through federally inspected plants. As, it's kind of a funny way to put it, as maybe the non-traditional market maybe becomes more traditional does that, if that makes sense, you know, you might have federally inspected plants that process some more of those non-traditional products as it just becomes more integrated in the overall market. So, you know, it's, it, I think it's a pretty interesting question of, about, you know, what our data can tell us versus what we know. We know uh, some of the, the, the ethnic market, the, the sales, because they were that's what they were buying and in, in, in fresh meat markets. Yet, while longer term overall trend might be a little bit different, particularly as we get past the mess of 2020. Thank you, Tim. I don't know if you're still on the line, if there's anything you wanted to add to that as far as ethnic lambs harvesting and, and um, at federally inspected. Not sure if he's still with us.
Okay. We'll go on to our next question here. Um, it's asking if anyone tracks mutton versus lamb consumption in the ethnic market. I don't know, Megan, if you've been able to see any anything on, on your side um, or Dr. Anderson. Lori, not that I know of, no. You know, I, the only thing I have done is taken the data for, for you know, what we think would be total mutton consumption and, and put that together like a per capita consumption, but mutton and separate out lamb, separate the two. I'm not sure what it means when I got done doing that other than the, you know, some of the, the trade data that implied a lot more mutton imports last year or uh, particularly towards, yeah, in, in, in 2020, I, I'm not exactly sure what that means. Does all of that go to the ethnic market? Uh, because some, some folks are looking for those lighter, younger animals. And so you get a whole bunch of different parts of the ethnic market. And so, yeah, I've calculated it, but I guess I don't know what it means. <laughs> there you go. Um, we have another question in here. And um, Megan, I, I don't know if you've seen it or... Dr. Anderson, you're welcome to, to, to chime in. Do you see any advantages for certifications like the humane certification or organic non-GMO? Do you see any advantages for producers? Um, I do, and Dr. Anderson, you can jump in too. I mean, we are a premium price protein and we wanna stay in that premium space. So the more value attributes we can talk about, the better. And I definitely think consumers are willing to pay premiums for certain value attributes. Um, like I, like I mentioned earlier, there's more, even more interest now about where our food comes from, how it's raised, what it's doing to fuel and nourish our, our health. So I think that those value attributes are incredibly important right now. Okay. Um, Dr. Anderson, how will the higher Australian exchange rate affect the interest of Australia importers in the U.S. market? So I, you know, I think that is part of the overall trade equation because those those exchange rates, as as they fluctuate, they show up in the price, and so you know that affects really the the value of them going here or or, or how attractive our price is uh, when exchange rates can kind of move against them, and then they can find they may find because of the exchange rate move some. Uh, more relatively more attractive markets than us. And so those, those fluctuations and, and particularly longer term trends and exchange rates, you know, those are important at, at affecting uh, uh, total trade. Uh, and, but we also see where they really show up is, is in prices. Prices adjust to that. If, they're, if because of the exchange rate, we're just, sometimes we're just not as attractive at a market, but it's all because of the exchange rate. Uh, and so those do affect overall trade levels. Right. Um, we have another one coming in, Dr. Anderson. Any concerns and benefits to our market for the massive government spending coming out of Congress this year? <laughs> and, and last year. And <laughs> so... Uh, you know, that's an interesting question to me because, so normally we would think of that, you know, pumping money into the economy, folks spend it. And, and we often think of that as it can drive some inflation. It can, you know, but, I, you know, the point is that if we look at, you know, our, our economy shrinking, the idea is to, can this prime the pump? Can this help folks that are particularly in need because of the big job losses in some sectors? Uh, but, you know, when people get that, they tend to spend it. And so, you know, to, as it affects people, you know, particularly on the lamb side, we are, Megan, you said a premium product. And, and so how do people spend that money? And, and, you know, if it leads to a growing economy that helps the overall economy get past the effects of coronavirus, I view that as, as most likely a positive effect for lamb uh, consumption for demand. Uh, and so, you know, I, there's a whole bunch of other concerns we might have like fiscal responsibility and deficits and stuff like that. 
but the more near term probably concern really I think is most likely uh, boy let's let's get out of this hole let's help jump start this and get out of this hole so we don't have the longer effects of that so I hope that's a fair answer to a really big question. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we have one more question and it's for you, Megan. Have any land board marketing programs targeted ethnic holidays like ID with influencers or recipes? Um, certainly, we've developed some ethnic marketing toolkits which are available in the Land Resource Center um, which have um, tips and tricks and authentic recipes for various minority populations. But even with our current um, programs and, and influencers, we've worked really hard to make sure that we're targeting a diverse group and finding food influencers that have interesting ethnic backgrounds and the ability to create authentic recipes for us and tell those important cultural um, stories. That's global flavors and heritage cooking and telling um, authentic stories about food is really on trend right now and resonates even with the average white American consumer too. So we're doing a lot of that. Okay, Lori, we better quit there. Okay, that, that'll conclude our question answer session. I, I'm just so happy with, with the way this meets moving and, and everybody uh, at one time in April, I wasn't sure there's was gonna be a land market and. Here we are, all I gotta do is fix this wool and pelt thing and, and we'll be on top of our game. And so with that, I guess it concludes the, the Lamb Council meeting and we'll turn it back to Control Central.